The original Volume 1 of Fixing Ruby was an important landmark for me. Not only was it my first major attempt to repair a property that I loved, but it was also the 100th video on my channel. It was also the start of my steady descent into insanity, so I guess we'll call it a wash. Regardless, I'm happy to present to you, today, with punched up writing, a fresh coat of paint, and crisp clean sound, Fixing Ruby Volume 1. So sit back, relax, and enjoy. Kanpai, everyone! Volume 1 of Ruby is a formative bedrock for the fandom, so my original intent in fixing it was to allow some of the more complicated elements to breathe while shoring up some of the more obnoxious shortcomings. The heart of that treatment still persists within this remaster, as does about all of the same content. The plot, character, and themes from my first go-around persist basically one-to-one. -one. What has changed are largely superficial elements. Additional art from the sketchy huntsman, better audio quality, cleaner editing, and a more refined vocabulary. The only substantive changes to the content of the scripts will be expansion upon the details of many different scenes and the condensing of the relevant information from the lore and history videos into the actual volumes going forward. Those two videos specifically were early videos in the development of this project, intended to quickly explain the differences between the canon setting and what would become the world of Fixing Ruby. They also established lore that's present for me as a writer to pull from should I ever have need of it, not necessarily elements that would ultimately be used. This understandably confused some people, as what was delivered in those expository videos was not necessarily what would have been diegetically delivered by the characters to the audience. The relevant exposition in those videos will now show up where it should have diegetically shown up in my original scripts, given the more detailed style this project has developed for itself. Along with that, by expanding on details in many different scenes, we've hopefully reduced the amount of familiarity one needs with the original source material. Still, I highly recommend, nay encourage, seeking out Ruby's official release and giving it a watch for yourself. Not only will it help you understand some of the odds and ends of this rewrite, but it's also just an interesting, if not enjoyable, watch all its own. Starting off with the trailers for this show, one of the things I can credit Ruby as a series for doing is using its advertising to add to the show's narrative. One of the key draws was that the original four trailers contributed story and character details that would serve us, the viewer, down the road, to the point that they're easily considered required watching. While this practice has since fallen to the wayside with the odd reemergence for volumes 4, 5, and 6, it was an ingenious bit of planning that no doubt contributed to building Ruby's fanbase very quickly. The original four trailers were pretty damn engrossing, and raised plenty of questions that would be touched on later in the series. Unfortunately, many of these elements don't come to any kind of fruition until two or three volumes after the first. Of the red, white, black, and yellow trailers, only the black trailer proved to have any kind of narrative weight for the first volume. You could make the argument that the yellow trailer did as well, but that's only because the first volume's antagonist makes an unspoken cameo at the start of it. It's not necessary for these trailers to actually tie into the main story, of course. They're just trailers, and they served their purpose of introducing us to the principal cast so fixing them in the long run only requires some careful tweaking. The red trailer for Ruby is iconic, and I'd wager it was the hook for most members of my audience. With no words, we are introduced to Ruby Rose, a ghostly red figure standing against the cold, white and blacks of a cliffside in the dead of winter. She's giving reference to her mother's tombstone, while the first notes of Red Like Roses Part 1 play. She retreats into the monochrome forest, and we let the lyrics of the song carry most of the scene. 
This is all before she emerges into a clearing and is confronted by wolf-like humanoids with pitch black fur and blood red eyes and teeth. Beowulves. Werewolf-like manifestations of a type of monster called Grimm that plague the world of this show. We'll learn more about them later in this volume. At the apex of the song, Ruby pulls out Crescent Rose, a mechanical wonder of a weapon that can shift between a modular scythe and a high-powered sniper rifle. Almost dance-like, Ruby dispatches the wolf monsters who dissolve against her attacks, ending the conflict with a flurry of attacks demonstrating an incredible amount of speed and dexterity. We end on a lingering shot of her posing in the middle of the field as shell casings rain down around her. This trailer is quite simple, but remains superb, and every fight in the show has been rightfully measured against this one since it aired. The only addendum for the purposes of fixing this show surrounds the Beowulves. I'll clarify now that the ones featured in this trailer are fledglings who lack both experience and the bony carapace that will become iconic for most Grimm later in the series. This is why it's so easy for Ruby to dispatch them, despite not even being fully trained in combat. Ruby is also notably more winded than she was in the original version of the trailer, though she maintains her confident and playful demeanor throughout the fight. The white trailer introduces us to Weiss Schnee, both in and out of universe with an announcer. The almost literally glowing girl in white with a distinct scar over her eye steps onto a stage and begins to sing Mirror Mirror, yet another banger song from this show. As the song lulls, we do a smooth transition through the ground to show a flashback where the main portion of the music kicks in. We are treated to a fight between a Scarless Weiss and a giant suit of armor. Similarly to Ruby, Weiss demonstrates a great amount of dexterity and speed in the fight, even demonstrating an ability to parry the armor's gigantic sword. With a combination of magic glyphs, and a rotating cylinder on her rapier that seems to imbue it with magic properties, Weiss emerges victorious. It's not a perfect victory, however, as a punch from the armor is what gave her the iconic scar over her eye that we saw while she was singing. How Weiss got her scar in the original was completely fine, though we're definitely taking a little more care so her blood drip lines up with the actual scar, so as to not confuse the entire fandom for years to come on when she actually got her scar. We transition back to her performance, where she's met with a roar of applause. In the original, this is where the curtains closed and the trailer ended. In our fix scene, we're adding a quick cut to three members in the crowd, all heavily shadowed to prevent the need for character designs. These are Wise's siblings, Whitley and Winter, as well as their father, Jock. We'll meet all these characters later, but for now, we're given a cryptic nod from Jock and a close-up of Weiss to show that she saw it. This all further hints at the royal test mentioned in the lyrics of Red Like Roses Part 1, and implies some level of familial pressure on Weiss from the outset. It's after this that Weiss bows, and the curtains close, and the trailer ends. Our next trailer is the Black trailer, and it's here we start to see more significant changes that will have ripple effects through the whole volume. The trailer starts with the camera panning down into a forest of black trees with blood-red leaves. Upon a rock, staring into the distance, is a lone girl garbed in black, sporting two sleek cat ears. We learn that her name is Blake, from a man in a black coat that steps into frame, and together the two take off into the forest. The two arrive at a cliff face and descend onto a passing train, cutting their way in once they land on it. Inside, they're met by automated robotic sentries, and what follows is the two sweeping their way up the train as a tag team, slicing through the automated opposition with speed and grace. Upon reaching a new compartment and discovering a box of resources, the man, Adam, orders Blake to go further up the train while he sets explosives. She pauses and asks about the crew on the train, and Adam responds, what about them? Giving Blake a moment of pause and distress. Before she can follow up on that question, the pair are attacked by a giant tetrapod droid that drops down from the ceiling. We are thrust into another action scene where Blake has to distract the robot while Adam readies a finishing attack. After absorbing the robot's main cannon blast into his blade, Adam sends out a powerful moon slice that obliterates the droid. As Adam goes to rejoin Blake on the next flat car, she looks up at him and apologizes before cutting it loose, implicitly protecting the crew from Adam's explosives. From Adam's perspective, we watch Blake fade into the distance, becoming a black silhouette amongst the red leaves. She turns and walks towards the front of the train, fiddling with something around her ears that we can't make out. Fans of Ruby will notice a major element missing in this version of the Black trailer, Blake's signature bow. In the original version, Blake wearing a bow in her hair makes very little sense. We'll learn later that people with animal features, the Faunus, are an oppressed class in this world, so wearing a disguise to cover her ears makes sense, 
were she not surrounded by other faunus already and actively participating in terroristic actions. And if her intent was to run away from Adam, why would she wear her disguise to the mission? By having her don the bow at the end of the trailer when she's out of eyeshot of Adam, it makes a more convincing disguise. This also changes the dynamic between Blake and the audience during the first volume. We are now in the know of a new fact that most characters aren't, allowing us to contextualize Blake's behavior on the fly instead of in retrospect. Now, let it be known that I liked the Blake reveal in Volume 1. It was one of the best setup reveals in the entire series, but I feel that doing this not only avoids pesky little plot holes, but also opens up new forms of tension and dramatic irony to explore when we finally arrive at Beacon. Now, with the most substantial changes out of the way, the following yellow trailer needs only a few adjustments, and that's mainly so one of our main cast doesn't end up with a rap sheet like she should have in the original. The trailer opens on a bright yellow motorcycle being driven by a blonde bombshell. Parking, she confidently walks her way into a nightclub, a fiery gold beacon against the club's dark interior. The girl, Yang Zhao Long, strolls through the room, playfully scanning it as she does and pulling a touchscreen phone-like device called a scroll from her pocket. She approaches the club's bar, where four distinct figures can be seen, a man in a black suit, a man in a white jacket, and twin girls in matching red and white outfits. Yang subtly takes a picture of the group as the man in the white jacket leaves before approaching the man in the black suit. The man, Junior, is the proprietor of the bar, and after a little playful dialogue from Yang, she decides to jump to the chase. Junior allegedly knows everything. Pulling up the image of a black-haired woman on her phone, she asks if he's seen her. Junior dismisses Yang, saying he doesn't know anything about the woman in the picture. In return, Yang playfully asks, are you sure? Here, have another photo of her, oops. And flicks to the next picture on her phone of Junior meeting with the man in white. Is that a picture of you with notorious criminal Roman Torchwick? Man, that'd really get the police's attention, wouldn't it? It'd be a shame if a concerned citizen sent this to them. Junior immediately orders one of his men to take the phone, only for Yang to quickly twist the man's arm. It's here that Junior recognizes Yang as some kind of huntress and orders the club goers to file out. The bulk of his guards begin to crowd in around Yang. Keeping cool, Yang playfully says they can just kiss and make up. She leans in to invite said kiss, and dumbly, Junior falls for it, leaning in himself. What follows is Yang punching Junior all the way back to the bar and engaging all of Junior's goons in hand-to-hand -hand combat. Highlights include beating up a dead mouse knockoff DJ, fighting Milcha and Melanie Malachite with their harmonized blade fighting styles, and taking on Junior with a rocket launching bat. The fight ends when some of Yang's hair gets torn off and she quite literally explodes with anger, rushing forward to knock Junior out of the building and onto the street. Yang walks out and straddles Junior, demanding answers, only to realize he's been knocked out cold. She drops him to the ground, saying he's useless before a confused Ruby comes walking down the street. She greets Yang before asking what she's doing there. The trailer ends as Yang peters off while saying that it's a long story. The changes made here are minor, but they go a long way towards establishing several facts about the setting. For one, Junior appears to be an upstanding businessman who has a reputation to keep publicly. Roman Torchwick is a major criminal element that Junior associates with, infamous enough to damage that reputation. Yang, meanwhile, is willing to flaunt the law if it means she'll accomplish her goals, and she's streetwise enough to know how to flirt with the deeper end of Vale's criminal underbelly. She's smart, resourceful, more than capable in a fight, and quick on the draw, which meshes well with the sweet, flirty, dumb blonde veneer she puts on. Most importantly though, this gives us a reason for the fight sequence beyond… well honestly there really wasn't one in the original. Yang just casually decided to commit sexual assault by grabbing Junior's balls after like a minute of talking, provoking the whole fight. It always surprised me that Junior never tried to have her arrested because it wasn't like this version where she had dirt on him to hang over his head. She just walked in and blew up his club. Doesn't really paint one of our four protagonists in the best of lights. Now, with all that important groundwork laid from the trailers, we can finally start dipping into Volume 1, or as I tried to say, Season 1. Yeah, back when I first started this series, I tried to change volumes into seasons. While I've kept the format, the ubiquity of volume in the franchise lexicon just… overtook any attempt to rebrand it, so it's here to stay. 
Still, these volumes do follow a more conventional seasonal layout, even if the name hasn't changed. Fixing Volume 1 consists of 20 episodes, the average length being 10 minutes apiece. This pushes the series' runtime to be just shy of a normal 12 to 13 episode anime season. It gives us a little more breathing room to make changes, and we know that Rooster Teeth is able to produce a show of this scale thanks to Red vs. Blue. This change, however, is not just to give us more time to work with, it's also a move to refine our focus for the show. A major issue that Ruby suffered in its early volumes was the lack of compartmentalized stories. To quote Fat Man Falling, The biggest problem with Ruby Volume 1 is that there isn't a plot. While later volumes have certainly evolved a central conflict, it took quite a bit of time to get there, leaving the first three volumes feeling disjointed unless viewed together. What we were basically given, especially in Volume 1, was a smattering of individual story arcs that didn't accomplish any forward momentum. By going into this fixing with a more seasonal format in mind, we set a very clear message that there will be a main plot thread that concludes at the end of each 20 episode run all while leaving enough threads and ideas open for future expansion. However, it should be kept in mind that this is a rough overview and not everything is going to be scripted down to the individual line. While this version of Fixing Volume 1 will certainly be going into greater detail, it still won't be covering everything, so I ask for a little bit of slack in that regard. If I tried to script everything out 100%, it'd take roughly 5 months to produce with the additional writing and editing I'd have to do. Alone. Retroactively, I know this for a fact because that's what happened with Volumes 5 and 6 after my scripts became incredibly detailed and took months to actually make. As always, if you feel I missed something important or something doesn't quite add up, please, please leave a comment down below. While the follow-up video has already been made for this volume, it's still nice to know that people are paying enough attention to criticize me. Our fix of Episode 1 cuts out the narration by Jen Taylor and skips right into the events of the show proper. Despite how well voice acted and surprisingly well written it is, the speech is ultimately redundant information to what we'll end up learning over the course of the volume, and it doesn't significantly play into the main plot thread. In the greater scheme of things, it seems even less relevant, since it focuses hard on dust, which hasn't played a major role in the abstract since, well, ever, really. So sadly, sorry Jen Teller, we'll have to see you after Volume 3. We fade in on a city street at night. Roman Torchwick, as previously seen in the yellow trailer, confidently treads his way down the road, flanked by his goons, completely unopposed by any of the bystanders. The posse slides right into From Dusk Till Dawn, a dust shop and convenience store. Intimidating, confident, and suave, Roman makes his demands of the shop owner. Not just the cash in the register, but also every ounce of dust the shop has to offer commenting it'll be more valuable than the piddling amounts of Lien in the register. Quickly, the shopkeep hands over a case of crystallized dust, while Roman's goons fill up containers from dispensers on the side of the room. This scene, basically untouched from the original show, establishes a great many things. Dust as a valuable resource in this world, Lien as a currency, and the imposing charisma of Roman Torchwick. As this happens, our hapless protagonist, Ruby Rose, is chilling in the back of the shop, reading comics with her headphones on, none the wiser to the robbery. One of the goons tries to hold her at blade point, and Ruby, confused, asks, Are you robbing me? When the man says, Yes, Ruby only delivers a, Huh, before we cut to that same man being launched through the shop's front window. What follows is the opening fight scene of the volume, with Ruby easily and non-lethally dispatching the remaining goons. That is, until Roman steps in to personally deal with her. It's a brief fight, but it's clear that he has more experience under his belt when fighting people. He's brutal and is quick to overpower Ruby, but before he can make a dry quip and finish her, an august woman with blonde hair appears to stop him. Glinda Goodwitch knocks Roman back, and using what appears to be magic and a riding crop, puts Roman on the defensive. Desperate, he reaches into a dust case and tosses one of the red crystals to the ground, firing on it with a gun built into his cane. The crystal explodes, causing Glinda and Ruby to flinch and allowing him to slip away. Ruby cheers at his defeat, gushing over how the woman is a real live huntsman and babbling about asking for her autograph. All Glinda gives her is a piercing glare that quiets Ruby's excitement. Match cut to Ruby in a police station interrogation room being given a full grilling from Glinda for her recklessness. Ruby is saved from Glinda's biting comments by the arrival of a white-haired man in green carrying a plate of cookies and a mug. 
This is Professor Ozpin, headmaster of Beacon Academy, whose introduction starts with him commenting on Ruby's silver eyes and moves smoothly into him complimenting her combat prowess for someone so young. After learning that Ruby wants to become a huntsman, a professional monster fighter, he smiles coyly and secures her admission to Beacon, which is the foremost academy specializing in the training of huntsmen. We match cut from Ruby's excited face to a more nervous one as she's being enthusiastically hugged by Yang. They're both on an airship with dozens of other students, all eagerly on their way to Beacon. We quickly establish the two are sisters, and Yang is ecstatic to be going to Beacon with Ruby. Ruby, however, is suffering quite a bit of anxiety, since she's been moved up two entire grades just to attend. Yang tries to reassure her, saying that this is where Ruby is going to blossom and make tons of friends and be the bee's knees. Ruby shoves her sister off and says, I don't want to be any kind of knee, I just want to be a normal girl with normal knees. Yang tries to dig deeper, but when Ruby says she doesn't want to be treated as special, Yang reassures her that she is special while giving her a sideways hug. She directs Ruby's attention out the window, to the city below, and says confidently that by the end of this, the two of them are going to be the best huntsmen in the whole of Vale. Ruby just has to have a little bit of confidence is all. Ruby doesn't seem too moved by the pep talk, but is quickly distracted when she can see the island they were raised on, Patch, from the window. Smiling to herself a little, Ruby supposes that home isn't so far away after all, and Yang follows up that Beacon is their home now. We end this episode off as a new character, a blonde-haired boy, becomes airsick, catching the girl's attention. We cut to outside of the airship as it approaches the looming spires of Beacon, all while the boy's vomiting is heard off-screen and Ruby and Yang scramble to avoid stepping in it. And then the camera fades to black. In most shows, episode 1 is an important tool to establish the tone and feeling of the series. Ruby is a strange show in this way because the trailers have already done quite a bit of the heavy lifting in that area. However, this rendition of Episode 1 helps to contextualize much of what we saw in those trailers. The audience should now have a rough map in their mind of how skilled each character is in relation to one another, as well as their role in the setting. We've effectively solidified where our protagonists stand in relation to the world and how far they have the potential to go. Our fix for Episode 2 leads off with something cut from the end of the original Episode 1 a news report by journalist Lisa Lavender discussing a protest of Faunus that turned violent after an organization known as The White Fang interrupted the demonstration. By moving it here, it better primes the audience that this isn't just a background detail to be ignored. Faunus are a major presence in society, and this White Fang organization is messing up their protests. Blake is among the crowd of students watching the report on the airship's projector, reacting to it with a combination of frustration and remorse that she works hard to school off her face. All of this helps give hints as to what happened back during the Black trailer and why Blake and Adam did the things they did, though certainly we're far from having all the pieces. The newscast is cut short and Glinda appears as a hologram to greet the new students to Beacon Academy. This is followed by a short speech where she lays out how privileged all the students are to go to Beacon and explains that it will be their job as huntsmen to uphold the prolonged peace their world has experienced the last few decades. The airship pulls in to land at Beacon's docks, and the boy from the end of episode 1 comes stumbling out ahead of everyone else, vomiting into a nearby trash can. Ruby and Yang walk out in the middle of the pack, side by side, and Ruby is quick to gush over all the unique weapons she can see among the crowd of students. Yang pulls Ruby back from wandering into the crowd to admire the weapons, and asks why Ruby is getting so excited over them when she has her own weapon she loves so much. Ruby comments back that she loves Crescent Rose, but seeing new weapons is like meeting new people, but better. Yang pulls Ruby's hood down playfully and recommends that Ruby try to make some friends of her own instead. Ruby questions why she'd need to do that, since she's already got Yang, only to pull her hood up and find Yang surrounded by a group of her own friends. Yang smiles sheepishly at Ruby and shuffles back into her buddies, saying quickly, Well, actually, my friends are here, so we kind of got to go catch up. Okay, see you bye! With a quick wave and a cartoonish bounce, Yang dashes off with her friends. Ruby spins, dizzy in the wake of Yang's animated dust cloud. Shaking off the dizziness, she groans about being left to handle both her luggage and Yang's all on her own. We cut to her at a communal pile of luggage messily stacked besides the airship. She manages to find her own bag among the mess and tries to pull it free, only to accidentally knock over a white bag as well. The white bag pops open, and Ruby is covered in a very fine red dust, visibly irritating her sinuses as she holds in a sneeze. This is where the audience is reintroduced to Weiss, stomping over to Ruby and pulling the white bag aside, shrilly asking what Ruby is doing with it. 
Ruby, still holding in a sneeze, can't properly answer, and Weiss continues a prissy tirade, complaining first about her staff putting her luggage in with the communal pool, and then about some idiot klutz spilling some of the most volatile dust she'd bothered packing, stating that a spill like this could have caused some serious damage. She emphasizes this by shaking a canister of red dust in Ruby's face, finally forcing Ruby's sneeze to come through. There's a spark, and in a flash, the red dust ignites in a fireball, covering Ruby and Weiss in blackened soot. Weiss stares in shock before her face morphs into pure rage. Weiss shouts that this is unbelievable, that it's exactly what she was talking about, and Ruby tries to apologize. Her apologies fall on deaf ears as Weiss quickly goes about questioning Ruby's age and downright implying that she's too uncoordinated to fight monsters. After being overwhelmed the whole conversation, Ruby stands up for herself, firmly stating, I said I was sorry, princess. A third voice joins the conversation as Blake walks in, grabs the jar of red dust, and calmly recites, It's Eris, actually. Weiss Schnee, heiress to the Schnee Dust Company, one of the largest producers of energy propellant in the world. For a brief moment, Weiss is elated someone recognizes her and her prestige, only for Blake to follow it up with. The same company infamous for its controversial business practices and questionable business partners. Weiss's cheeks redden and she grabs back the jar, sputtering angrily the whole while before storming off with her luggage. Ruby yells after her that she'll try to make it up to her. Ruby attempts to turn to Blake and pick up the conversation, but Blake has already moved on deeper into campus without saying another word. Most of the scene was basically verbatim from the original show since it was already pretty good. It delivered a hefty amount of information in a short amount of time while keeping it diegetic, relevant, and easy to absorb. With the few tweaks we've introduced, such as the luggage pool to set the scene, the earlier newscasting to mentally prime the audience, and our knowledge of Blake's status as a faunus, we can get a better picture of the racial conflict currently bubbling in the world at large, as well as how it reflects upon each of the three characters in the scene. So all kudos go out to Miles and Carrie for the writing here. Clunky as it was in the original, it was effective in delivering a dense amount of narrative information. That isn't easy. Ruby, once again alone, sags to her knees and mopes. Welcome to Beacon. A helping hand appears in frame, and we pan up to find the blonde boy from earlier offering Ruby some help standing. He introduces himself as John. Ruby takes his hand and introduces herself, standing before asking if he wasn't the guy vomiting on the airship earlier. We jump to Ruby and John wandering a more secluded part of campus, bonding over both being fish out of water amongst their peers. It's here we get quite a few memorable lines between the two. Not only do we establish their nicknames for each other going forward, Vomit Boy and Craterface, but also John's legendary self-introduction of, well, the name's John Ark. Short, sweet, rolls of the tongue, ladies love it. We get Ruby explaining what kind of weapon Crescent Rose is, a scythe that's also a gun. John shows off his sword and shield, which are simple weapons but also family heirlooms, and we establish that Ruby was the one to also construct her own scythe. Similar to the previous scene, this one is surprisingly dense with information and in-jokes that'll run deep through the heart of the series. So again, good job Miles and Carrie. The scene itself ends with Ruby and John realizing they're lost. We cut to them out of breath as they arrive at Beacon's auditorium, and Ruby is almost immediately called away by Yang. Ruby leaves John to hang with her sister, and he mopes about finding another cute quirky girl to talk to. As he walks away, a new girl with deep red hair and bronze armor watches him. Back with Ruby, she catches up with Yang, explaining how she tripped over some luggage and exploded after Yang ditched her. Yang infers this means that Ruby had a meltdown, but Weiss arrives and points at Ruby accusingly. Ruby jumps into Yang's arms, muttering, Oh god, it's happening again! As Weiss yells that Ruby was lucky neither of them were blown off the cliff. Yang is shocked that Ruby literally exploded, while Ruby climbs out of her arms and tries to defend herself that it was an accident. Weiss shoves a pamphlet into her face, and rapidly lists off a disclaimer about the usage of Schnee Company dust. Ruby is lost in the jargon, and Weiss clarifies, you want to start making things up to me? Ruby says, Absolutely? And Weiss wastes no time in shoving the pamphlet into her arms and demanding, Read this and never speak to me again. Yang tries to do damage control, recommending Ruby and Weiss try to get off on the right foot this time. Ruby agrees and stiffly tries to reintroduce herself, suggesting they can go shopping for school supplies together. Weiss doesn't take the remark well, sarcastically saying, Yeah, and we can paint our nails and try on clothes and talk about cute boys like tall, blonde, and scraggly over there, throwing a derisive thumb at a clueless John. 
Ruby doesn't read the room and thinks Weiss isn't joking before Weiss flatly turns her down with a decisive, no. The auditorium quiets down as Osman steps onto stage to give a speech, saying, I'll keep this brief. You have traveled here today in search of knowledge, to hone your craft and acquire new skills. And when you have finished, you plan to dedicate your life to the protection of the people, to save them from the threat of the Grimm and the disaster they leave in their wake. But I look amongst you, and all I see is wasted energy, in need of purpose, direction. You assume knowledge will free you of this, but your time at this school will prove that knowledge can only carry you so far. It is up to you to take the first step. The crowd whispers at Osman's harsh words, and even Ruby and Yang comment how off all of Osman's delivery was. The scene ends on a quick joke, as John slides up to Weiss's side and comments that he's a natural blonde, making her slap a hand to her face in irritation. We cut away to some form of rundown safe house apartment where Tortric comes stomping through the door. Clearly frustrated and still banged up from his fight with Glinda, he mutters about how useless Junior's goons were and complains about how many tails he had to shake just to get home. Brushing the dust off his coat, he walks into a more lavish room of the house where we find a bedridden girl with pink, brown, and white hair. She blinks at him with eyes that swap between the three colors seemingly at random. Roman sighs and sits beside her bed, asking if she's feeling better. She nods appreciatively, and he gives her a warm smile. He mentions that he missed her during that last job, and says that he's got something big planned that he's definitely going to need her help to accomplish, so she better hurry up and get better. The camera floats up to the window to look at the full moon, transitioning us to the windows of Beacon Academy's cafeteria. Here we find Ruby and Yang at different levels of excitement over the entire freshman class sleeping in the same room together. Yang likes the eye candy the men are providing her, and Ruby is still sulking over her inability to make friends, spending her time writing a letter to her old classmates back at Signal Academy. Yang comments that Ruby simply made one friend and one enemy, and she'll have better luck in the following days. Their attention is caught by the nearby Blake, who has lit a candle to read by. Ruby recognizes her from the explosion incident, and before she can really protest, Yang has dragged Ruby over to introduce herself. Unfortunately, this introduction doesn't go warmly. The best they get is Blake's name and a passive-aggressive comment that she wants to read in peace. Yang tries to write Blake off as a lost cause, but Ruby manages to find a point of connection with Blake over the book she's reading, one about a man with two souls. Ruby reminisces to Blake about Yang reading books to her every single night, of the stories of heroes and monsters, and explains that it's the reason she wants to become a huntress, to fight for what's right and protect people who can't protect themselves. Blake says it's admirable, but life is unfortunately not like a fairy tale, to which Ruby catches her off guard by saying, Well, that's why we're here, to make it better. Yang is caught up on how adorable Ruby is with her optimism, hugging her and giving her a noogie, saying Ruby will make plenty of friends, she knows it. As Ruby struggles, the commotion catches the attention of Weiss, who stomps over to yell at the two for making such a ruckus while people are trying to sleep. This ignites a heated back and forth between the three that Blake doesn't seem keen to interact with. Calmly, Blake blows out her candle, bathing the scene in darkness and ending the episode. A special thanks goes out to all of my wonderful patrons for supporting the channel. If you like this content and want more of it, please consider supporting it. Also consider picking up my new action-adventure novel, The Artificer, which is now available for purchase on Amazon in digital and in print. With that all said, back to your regularly scheduled fixing. Episode 3 opens from the perspective of a sleeping student being awoken by an aggressively bubbly red-headed girl. Or... orange-headed? This is anime. What's considered a redhead is a little vague, considering we have four of them in this volume alone, and only two of them have anything resembling a similar shade. Anyway, I digress. This is Nora Valkyrie, and the boy she's waking up is the calm, stoic Lai Ren. We montage through their morning routine together, Nora chattering excitedly the whole time over being at Beacon with Ren since they've been together since they were kids. She's quick to awkwardly clarify, Not together together. Not that I'm saying you're not handsome, but that'd just be weird, right? She quickly moves on as they go to get breakfast, and she continues devising plans to ensure that no matter what, she and Ren end up on the same team after initiation. She ultimately lands on a plan as we cut to them pulling their unique weapons out of lockers they were apparently assigned by the staff. As she puts a combination hammer grenade launcher on her back, Nora asks if Ren can make the sound of a sloth. 
sliding collapsible bladed machine pistols into his sleeves, Ren finally speaks. Nora? I don't think sloths make a lot of noise. Nora pauses only a second, invigorated by the response. That's why it's perfect! No one will suspect we're working together! Ren only smiles at her shenanigans, beckoning she follow after him to where initiation is going to take place. Nora bounces on after him, once again reiterating, not together together, with a giggle. This little scene accomplishes a few neat little things aside from introducing us to some of the best characters in the show. It also establishes that after initiation, students are sorted into teams, and the process has an element of luck that some characters might want to subvert. This becomes relevant as Nora and Ren pass Ruby and Yang on their way out, equipping themselves at their own lockers. Ruby is ecstatic they can finally skip the awkward parts of getting to know people and get right into the good part, letting her weapon and her skills do the talking. Yang's excited for herself, sure, but she's a little more skittish about Ruby's attitude during initiation, suggesting that Ruby try to make her own friends and learn to work together with new people. Ruby refutes the suggestion, saying meeting new people has nothing to do with fighting, and I don't need people to help me grow up. I drink milk. When the topic of teams come up, Ruby says flippantly that she'll just be on Yang's team so she won't need to socialize. Yang, however, suggests that maybe Ruby should try to find her own team to be a part of, to help her break out of her shell, which ends up igniting an argument between the two sisters we only see the beginning of. This is because, passing behind them, is John, fretting over finding the locker he'd put its stuff in the night before, confused as to how he might have mixed up the numbers. He walks past Weiss and the red-headed girl in the background of Episode 2 as they both fit themselves for initiation. Weiss asks the other girl, named Pierre Nikos, if she has given any thought to who she wants to team up with, buttering her up with offhand compliments about Pierre's fame and strength. None of those seem to phase the more modest Pira, who replies that she's hoping to see where the chips fall, but Weiss is persistent and asks if the two of them could maybe partner up. Pira very politely says that sounds grand, and this makes Weiss uncharacteristically ecstatic, sinking off into her own little world mentally to brag about how powerful they'll be as a duo. The smartest girl in the school teamed up with the strongest? They'll be unstoppable! Popular! Get perfect grades! Nothing could come between them! And that's when John pops up between the two, confidently introducing himself to both girls. He tries to flirt up Weiss, and when Pira corrects him that teams are made up of four people, not just two, he slides over to her and boldly proclaims that if Pira is lucky, she'll wind up on the winning team. Weiss is quick to separate the two and asks if John knows who he's talking to, going through all of Pira's qualifications. Graduate top of her class from her old combat academy, Sanctum, won something called the Mistral Regional Tournament a record four years in a row, and she was the athlete featured on the front of every Pumpkin Pete's Marshmallow Flake cereal box. That last one is the only one John recognizes, and immediately he's infatuated, saying they only do that for star athletes and cartoon characters. Now properly informed, Weiss asks if he thinks he's in the position to have Pira on his team. John deflates, his confidence leaving him, and he guesses that he's not. He apologizes, but Pira reassures him she thinks that he'd make a great leader. This bolsters him, but Weiss tries to cut him back down. He responds by bragging that Pira is clearly on board for his team, and spots are filling up fast, but maybe he could find a place for Weiss on it. Weiss groans and asks Pira for help. Pira ends up helping by using her weapon, a javelin, to pin John to the wall of the locker room, apologizing as he's stuck there. Glinda comes over the PA and instructs the students to head off to the Beacon Cliffs for initiation, prompting Weiss and Pira to leave. Pira grabs her javelin on the way out, saying it was nice to meet John, and he gives a limp, likewise, as she goes. Yang and Ruby go over to him to make sure he's okay, and as they do, another student, a rather large, bulky one in some plate mail, brushes rudely by Yang on his way out. The three spare the guy a glance before Ruby pulls John to his feet. He laments that his dad's advice, that women love confidence, didn't work. And Yang quickly points out that him nicknaming Weiss Snow Angel wasn't the best of starts. Pride wounded, he's pulled out to initiation by Ruby and Yang. We arrive out on an idyllic green cliffside where students are instructed to stand on large metal pads that line the edge. Osman opens initiation by welcoming them and explaining their skills and abilities will be evaluated in the Emerald Forest. Commenting on the rumors about teams, Glinda clarifies that they'll be given teams today, lighting up an excited murmur between all the students. Ospin goes on to explain that teammates will be together for their entire duration at Beacon, so it's best to pair with compatibility in mind. That being said, the first person you make eye contact with after landing will be your partner for the next four years. 
Ruby is immediately terrified by this news, and Nora is proudly vindicated for her making a plan with Ren. Ospin goes on to explain that after the pairs have partnered up, they will head north, meeting opposition along the way. There are no Grimm within the forest, however the natural inhabitants of the forest typically prove to be just as hostile. Do not hesitate to destroy everything in your path, or you will die. Elaborating on the objective of initiation, students are to locate an abandoned temple, recover a relic from within, and get to a predetermined location for extraction. The location will be revealed to the students on their scrolls once they recover a relic. Students will be monitored and graded during all of initiation, but instructors will not intervene. Ren narrows his eyes and asks how there are no Grimm in the forest, but Ozpin ignores him, ironically asking if there are any questions. John raises his hand, but like with Ren, Ozpin ignores him, boldly proclaiming, Good! Now, take your positions. Everyone but John braces themselves against the pads beneath their feet, and one by one they are launched into the sky, deep into the Emerald Forest. John continues asking his question, wondering what exactly students are supposed to do in order to land. Ozpin flatly says that students have to determine their own landing strategy. Before John can get any further answers, his pad launches him, sending him hurtling through the air. Ozpin watches stoically, sipping from his mug as the episode ends. Episode 4 opens on a crow peacefully flying through the air above the Emerald Forest, only for a blur of red to crash right through, exploding it in a burst of feathers. Ruby's voice can be heard crying, Birdie, no! She deploys her scythe and uses the blade to catch a tree's branch, swinging around it to curb her momentum and land safely. Around the forest, we get clips of the other major characters doing something similar. Why summoning glyphs to step her way down from the sky, Ren using his pistol blades to spin around a tree trunk, and Yang actually propelling herself more and more horizontally using blasts from her shotgun bracers. She actually fumbles a bit at the end of the more acute descent, but rolls out of the bushes yelling, Nailed it! Of particular note is Pura's descent, crashing through several trees using a rounded shield before coming to a stable stop on a high branch. She pulls out her javelin and transforms it into a rifle, aiming down the scope and catching sight of the helpless John in freefall. With not a moment's hesitation, she flips it back into a javelin and throws it, propelling it even further by firing the rifle at the same time. It soars cleanly through the air and plucks John out of the sky, pinning him harmlessly to a tree. A weak, thank you, drifts from where he's stuck, and Pura yells back with a polite, I'm sorry. Up on Beacon's hillside, Ospin and Glinda are observing the students on their scrolls, thanks to a monitoring network spanning the entire forest. In fact, Ospin occasionally swipes a control that causes parts of the geography to shift in subtle ways through an underground mechanism, guiding students different directions. Through the screen, we can see the jerk from the locker room pulling a green-haired punk rocker-looking student out of a tree after his path was diverted. Through the speakers, we can hear them introduce themselves, with the larger boy being Cardin and the smaller one being Russell. Cardin immediately demands that Russell not slow him down, wasting not a second for Russell to get his bearings. Osman then swipes to a different set of cameras, where we see Ruby rushing through the forest and Weiss getting a read on her surroundings. With another flick, we can see the terrain subtly shift, and Ruby rushes right along a new path, none the wiser. We cut down to Ruby's perspective as she's dashing through the forest, running panicked at the risk of being unable to team up with Yang. She considers John and Blake as alternatives, but John isn't a good fighter and Blake doesn't seem like she'd hold a conversation. Ironically, just as Ruby's mind is getting to the last person she knows, she bursts through the trees and locks eyes with Weiss Schnee. The two stare at each other, and after a beat of silence, Weiss begins to walk in the opposite direction, completely ignoring Ruby despite her pleas of, Wait, where are you going? We're supposed to be teammates! We cut back to an amused Ozpin watching the scene, only for Glinda to interrupt him. She holds up her own scroll with an image that the audience can't see. Ozpin's eyes narrow at the image, and Glinda asks if they should cancel initiation. Taking a pensive sip from his mug, Ozpin says, No. Let us see how they handle this, but have the other instructors on standby. Back with Weiss and Ruby, the two have arrived at the base of the tree that John is stuck to, and Weiss contemplates, silently, and only for a second, lying and taking John as her partner instead. When John waves at her, she turns and heads back the way she came, grabbing Ruby by the hood and declaring, By no means does this make us friends. Ruby is simply overjoyed that Weiss came back and lets herself be dragged away. John yells after them, asking who's going to get him down. This is when Pura walks up and asks very wryly if John still has any spots on his team. John is embarrassed by the pot shot to his ego, but still smiles warmly down at her, setting their friendship in motion. 
We follow after Ruby and Weiss, where Ruby has pulled out of Weiss's grasp. The two bump heads over Ruby slowing them down, only for Ruby to demonstrate that she can move incredibly fast with her semblance. The concept of semblances is touched upon briefly here, to tentatively explain the more magical powers we've seen demonstrated in this show so far, such as Ruby's speed, Weiss's glyphs, Blake's shadow clones, and Yang's… uh… explosiveness. We'll get further elaboration on the topic in the future, but for now, it's simply used to establish that Ruby can rapidly accelerate her body and move at blinding speeds. Despite this speed, however, Weiss is still dismissive, as Ruby is still wasting time, only to realize that Ruby has jumped the gun and run off into the forest ahead of her. A growling from the brush catches her attention, and she yells Ruby's name in frustration as a hungry wolf stalks out from between the trees. We jump over to Yang wandering her way through the forest, still unpartnered, when she comes across two black bears. They immediately turn territorial and attack. Initially, Yang is cocky and having fun with the fight, until one of the bears claw off a lock of her hair. Similar to Junior, Yang becomes infuriated and rushes forward in her rage to one-hit KO the bear. She turns to the second bear, hair still flickering with fire, when it falls over dead, having been stabbed in the back by Blake's sickle gun, sword, on a ribbon… thing. Look, I I'm gonna level with you, Gamble Shroud is a weirdly complicated weapon to explain. Anyway, Yang and Blake lock eyes, solidifying their partnership as Yang claims casually, I could've taken him. Episode 5 cuts back to Weiss and Ruby, who are busy combating a pack of wolves. Weiss attempts to take a more structured, fencer-like approach to combating the pack, using the dust chambers on a rapier to light the blade on fire as her opening move. However, Ruby's more spontaneous fighting style gets in the way, throwing Weiss off, which ends up igniting a whole row of trees. The situation untenable, Weiss grabs Ruby and the two flee from the encounter. Once in a safer clearing, Weiss shoots Ruby out for her lack of communication during the fight, and Ruby shoots back, Well, I'm sorry you need my help to win a fight. I'm just fine on my own. Weiss scoffs and rolls her eyes, walking on without her partner. Well, congratulations on being the strongest child to sneak her way into Beacon. Bravo! Ruby growls and angrily cuts down a nearby tree with her scythe before following after the heiress. Over with a less tense pairing, Pure and John are steadily making their way through the underbrush of the forest, moving branches and other obstacles out of the way for each other as they go. At one point, Pure accidentally lets go of a branch that swings back and cuts John in the face. She's surprised to see him bleeding and asks him where his aura is. He's confused, and tries to play off the fact that he doesn't know what she's talking about. Pyrrha is briefly confused herself, but smiles and explains what Aura is. It is a manifestation of the soul, an energy that can protect a person from harm, strengthening them from within long after their body has become exhausted, and alert them to danger well before it ever comes. John asks if monsters have Aura, and Pyrrha responds, no, they cannot. The monsters they fight are soulless, manifestations of anonymity. They are the darkness while humans are the light. As Pyrrha explains this, we cut over to Ren, traveling alone through the forest, encountering the first proper Grimm in the series, a double-headed snake known as a King Taijitsu. He slides around the monster, which looks straight at him, yet seemingly sees nothing. Unfortunately, he hits a rough patch of underbrush, making a sound, and the snake flails violently outward. He brings his hands forward to block the attack, a visible field of cherry blossom pink energy coating his palms as he does. Pyrrha continues to elaborate over the fight that Aura can be projected outward to form a barrier, that all of their gear and weapons are conduits this force can flow through as extensions of the self. John boldly states, Like a force field! Earning a chuckle from Pyrrha, who tells him that yes, something like that. With Ren, he has continued his fight with the King Taijitsu, drawing his weapons, but it does little to help. After stabbing the blades into the carapace of one of the heads, it flails to the side and slams him into a tree. His aura flares over his body as he connects, and his blades slip from where he'd embedded them. He's struggling to his feet as the snake comes down to bite him. We cut back to Pyrrha and John properly, where Pyrrha cups John's face, instructing him to close his eyes and concentrate. He does, and Pyrrha recites a mantra. For it is in passing that we achieve immortality. Through this we become a paragon of virtue and glory to rise above all, infinite in distance and unbound by death. I release your soul, and by my shoulder protect thee. Pyrrha glows with red energy, and John slowly glows with white. Once the light fades, she sags, and John calls her name in concern. Pyrrha explains that she used her own aura to unlock his, and it's now protecting him, watching with a grin as the scratch on his face knits itself shut. Idly, she comments that he has a lot of it. 
She does note that it's strange he didn't have it unlocked already. Almost everyone going to a combat school that she knows of has their auras active. John shrugs it off, commenting that his mother did always say he was a bit of a late bloomer. He doesn't give Pyrrha time to follow up, and enthusiastically trudges onward into the trees. Back with Ren, he's about to be eaten when a strange, animal-like call echoes out of the woods, followed closely by the sound of something large moving in the underbrush and a guttural growl. Bursting from the trees is Nora, riding on the back of a bear, hammer raised high. She brings it down to destroy one of the King Taijutsu's heads before drifting over to where Ren is staggering to a stand and brushing off his sleeves. He looks up at her, saying calmly that he still doesn't think that's what a sloth sounds like. She leans down with a smug smile and boops him on the nose. He smiles in return, and Nora pulls him up onto the bear's back, just as the King Taijitsu has stopped writhing in pain. The two, plus Bear, bound off into the forest with the now one-headed snake in hot pursuit. We get a brief stop in with Glinda and Ozpin as they watch Nora and Ren, with Glinda commenting that the two did well enough against the Grimm, but she's worried how the rest of the students will fare. This gets no response or commentary from Ozpin, who is silently watching Yang and Blake on his scroll. With the duo, we can see there's already cracks forming in their own chemistry. Yang has just finished punching a bulbous frog-alligator hybrid creature, sending it careening into a swampy area of the forest, where a small pot of the creatures can be seen hissing at her in Blake's intrusion. Blake narrows her eyes and asks if Yang needs to be so violent. Lash gators are ambush predators, they could have just walked around it. Yang shrugs at the question, saying the fastest path to the ruins she saw from the air is straight through. Again, Blake seems annoyed, replying they're not exactly in a hurry. Shaking her head, Yang explains that she has a sister that she has to look out for, so she wants to get where she knows her sister will wind up, just to keep an eye on her. The two continue moving through the forest as they talk, with Blake reassuring Yang that her sister will probably be fine if she made it into Beacon. Besides, she's a twin, right? Wouldn't it be kinda like Yang doubting herself? Yang groans and replies that they're not twins. Her little sister got moved up, and she's not ready… Yang trails off and mutters a frustrated, never mind, before forging further ahead. Blake sighs and follows after, explaining she just doesn't see the point of causing trouble when they could probably get there just as fast if they stick to the edges of the danger. Yang rolls her eyes and replies, Oh come on, we're huntsmen! Where's the fun in that? As she says this, she moves a piece of brush aside, revealing a nest of scampers, creatures resembling squirrel-chimpanzee hybrids. There's a pause as the girls stare at the primates and vice versa. Yang hops on her heels to say, whoa -oh, before the creatures break out in angry shrieks. Yang and Blake flee, rushing through the forest as the scampers chase after them. Yang pulls Blake through the brush by the hand, eventually turning enough corners to trick the scampers into rampaging deeper into the woods. Out of breath, Blake pulls herself free of Yang's grip and growls that Yang needs to start looking where she's going. Yang, equally winded, says that she was, and motions ahead of them. Through the next few trees, the two can make out a clearing and a stone ruin further on. Blake sighs again and walks forward wordlessly, giving Yang a cold shoulder. Yang follows after in disbelief, asking, What? Nothing? Come on, I got us here intact, that's at least worth a little praise. They cross the field and arrive in the ruins, where ornamental chess pieces are arranged on individual pedestals. Yang comments that some of them are already missing, but still doesn't earn a word from Blake. Musing that they should probably pick one, Yang reaches over and grabs a golden knight, waving it for Blake to see and asking, How about a cute little pony? Blake, surprisingly, smirks and says, Sure. The two make their way out of the temple as Yang says, Well that wasn't too hard. And Blake replies, Well it's not like this place is very difficult to find. Yang looks to Blake, jaw drooping with shock, before morphing into a smile. Wordlessly, Blake smiles too. We cut over to Ruby and Weiss, struggling through the brush, the two complaining about being lost and putting the blame on each other over it. As they exit into a clearing, they're greeted by the sight of a large withered tree, and on top of it is the massive black shape of a sleeping bird. Odd, Ruby correctly identifies it as a grim called a Nevermore, and Weiss mutters that it has to be old considering its size. Ruby shakes her head, confused because Osmond said there were no grim in the forest. Weiss hisses, asking if it matters now that they know that there is one. Ruby supposes not, and suggests they backtrack to avoid it. It's at this point that the scampers that Yang riled up come rushing towards them from the trees, having locked onto the two of them as their new targets. Weiss draws her rapier, panicked as she says that they can't take them on if they also wake up the Nevermore. Lo and behold, the Nevermore has started to stir because of the ruckus below its perch, increasing the tension of the situation. 
Ruby looks between the Scampers and the Nevermore before muttering to herself, Not if we don't fight the Nevermore. Wise is confused by Ruby's muttering, but Ruby grabs her by the hand, stating, Come on, I have an idea of how to get out of here. Wise tries to resist, but Ruby dashes towards the tree with her semblance, dragging Weiss with her as she complains. The episode ends as the Nevermore cranes its neck back and screeches into the sky. Episode 6 picks up with John and Pura as they come across a cave. Standing outside are Cardin and Russell, who are talking just out of earshot. They quiet down when John and Pura approach, and taking an opportunity, Cardin tries to schmooze the two partners up. He explains that he thinks the ruins might be through the tunnel, but he was worried about being caught from behind by some of the wildlife. They were debating whether to split up or not just as John and Pira arrived. Now that there's another pair, it's perfect. One pair can explore the cave, and one can protect it. Pira is wary of the plan, but John falls for it hook, line, and sinker, unwittingly becoming Cardin's canary in the coal mine, pun very much intended. Following John's lead, Pira follows him into the cave. The two disappear as we linger back with Cardin and Russell. Russell asks what happens if they die, and Cardin shrugs, saying they'll wait half an hour before they move on. The two don't get a chance to wait that long as a ruckus emanates from the foliage. The two turn and almost immediately begin running in fear as Nora and Ren come bursting out of the woods on their bear, Nora laughing maniacally the whole way. Behind them is the King Taijitsu, still in hot pursuit. The four students, and Bear, flee between the trees, with the giant snake gaining more and more ground. This is when the scampers that Yang startled cross their paths, distracting the Grim and giving the four breathing room to flee. Back in the cave, John and Pira are navigating by torchlight and have a tame disagreement over whether or not the ruins would actually be in the cave, with Pira thinking they're just going to get lost. John asks her to humor him, since he's already made the torch. They make it a little further in, and in the dim lighting they come across a glowing orb in the shadows. John thinks it's the relic they're looking for and immediately latches onto it, to Pira's concern. They quickly discover it's actually the glowing gold tail of a Deathstalker, a grim that takes on the appearance of a giant scorpion. John screams in fear and we cut to outside the cave, where Pira has barely managed to get out of the Deathstalker's way as it rushes out of the entrance. John screams for help, and Pira is unable to offer assistance before John loses his grip and is flung over the trees and into the distance. Pira watches with shock before turning to the monster, wincing with embarrassment and running away. A black feather falls across the screen, and we transition over to Ruby and Weiss, clutching onto the side of the soaring Nevermore, the wind hurtling through their hair. Weiss complains that this was a terrible idea, and Ruby reassures her that they're fine, stop worrying. The two continue to disagree until a fed-up Ruby recommends, Well, why don't we just jump? Weiss responds, What? Are you insane? Only to be met with silence as Ruby has already let go. Weiss shrieks, Oh, you insufferable little red! We cut to Blake and Yang, standing on the temple steps, eyeing their surroundings from all the strange noises. The scampers, the multiple grim, the screaming students. Their faces are drawn in confusion before Ruby plummets from the sky above. In a moment of incredible coincidence, Ruby's fall is bisected by John's, catching her mid-air and landing them both in a tree where they both greet each other dizzily. Blake stares at the tree and asks, Wasn't that your sister? Yang blinks and goes to speak, only for a new sound to catch their attention. Nora, Ren, Cardin, Russell, and Bear all burst out into the clearing with the temple. Nora's bear collapses and she pats it on the head sadly, complaining, Aww, it's broken! Shrugging to herself, she stands and trots off towards the ruins, with Ren in exacerbated pursuit. Hopping into the ruins, she quickly gravitates to a rook-shaped relic and grabs it, proudly singing, I'm queen of the castle, I'm queen of the castle, before being called back by Ren. In the background, Russell goes to pick up one of the relics, only for Cardin to push him aside and grab the one he prefers, the Black Bishop. Watching from the steps, Blake, now much more deeply confused, asks, Was she... Riding a bear? Again, Yang goes to say something when Weiss's voice calls down from above, screeching to Ruby, How could you leave me? On the branch, Ruby and John both stand, dusting themselves off. Ruby yells up, I said jump! The collection of students watch as Weiss loses her grip and begins to fall. John sees an opportunity to play hero and jumps from the branch to catch her, which, hey, he succeeds at being her cushion when she lands. She gives him a pitiless, My hero. And he just groans, My back! In response. Cardin and Russell, from a spot leaning against the ruins, laugh at the two. Blake shakes her head. 
Was that a Nevermore? Finally, Yang snaps. I can't take it anymore! Can everyone just chill out for two seconds before something crazy happens again? The other students in the clearing stare at her and go silent as Yang visibly cools down from such a concentrated dose of chaos. Taking a calming breath and pushing her hair back, she looks over to find Ruby jumping down from the tree. Elated, Yang smiles and yells, Ruby! before moving in for a hug. Ruby does likewise, yelling, Yang! and opening her arms wide. Nora pops up between them and yells, Nora! freezing them both in their tracks, baffled to the ginger's antics. In the distance, Pura comes rushing out of the tree line, Deathstalker in hot pursuit. She yells after John, who calls after her in kind, and she jumps just in time to dodge one of its claw swipes. Slashing a tree at the edge of the clearing, she manages to pin the monster down, but not before another swipe sends her careening across the field. She lands in a heap at the group's feet, and while Blake and John go to help Pira up, Yang dryly quips, Great, the gang's all here. Now we can die together. Ruby, however, takes that as a challenge and rushes forward as the Deathstalker frees itself of the tree. Using a shot from her scythe and her speed, she tries to get a leaping strike in, only to be battered aside by the scorpion monster. She panics and tries to get some shots off on it, but its carapace is too thick and the bullets skid right off. Realizing she's outmatched, Ruby begins to rush back to the group while Yang rushes forward to try and assist her. It's at this same time that the Nevermore sees her as the weak link and moves in to attack, sending a barrage of razor-sharp quills raining down into the field. Ruby's cape is caught by one, pinning her in place, and Yang is waylaid as she's caught in the middle of the quills. The Deathstalker catches up to the trapped Ruby, and all seems lost until a white blur crosses the screen. A wall of ice pops up between Ruby and the Deathstalker, catching the Grimm's tail just inches before it manages to spear Ruby. Weiss launches into an irritated screed against Ruby, calling her childish, dim-witted, and hyperactive, and even goes so far as to question her fighting style. But Weiss levels an olive branch that she herself can be… difficult. So if they're going to work together, Weiss will try to be nicer so long as Ruby stops trying to show off. Ruby explains she wasn't trying to show off, she just wanted Weiss to know that Ruby can actually be a proper huntress. Weiss rolls her eyes and walks back towards the crowd, saying that Ruby is fine, much to Ruby's elation. Ruby pulls at her cape as Yang walks up and punches the quill pinning her in place. Yang gives her sister a hug, happy she's okay, but John breaks the tender moment by yelling out that the Nevermore is circling back around. The three make it back to the group, and Weiss says there's little point in dilly-dallying, their objective is right in front of them. John sighs in relief and agrees. Run and live! That's an idea I can get behind. Ruby walks up into the temple and grabs the remaining gold knight, while John walks up beside her and grabs the remaining white rook. They share an anxious look before exiting the temple and linking up with their groups. Ruby looks at her scroll as they leave the ruins, pointing out with some concern that the evac site is actually back the way they came, beyond the Deathstalker, and now the King Taijitsu as it slithers out of the forest. Cardin walks up from the ruins and shrugs, replying that they can just rush past. Weiss rolls her eyes and glares at him. If you want to die, go right ahead. Ruby keeps her eyes trained on the approaching monsters, rocking on her feet while trying to come up with a plan. Beside her, John is looking more freely around the environment, and that's when he catches sight of more ruins just beyond a hill. He quickly forms an idea. If they can lure the Grimm over to those ruins, the ten of them should have a better collective chance of circumventing the monsters and making a break for the evac site. Blake shrugs and says, Better than anything I've come up with. And Ren agrees, glancing at the incoming monsters before saying, It's time we leave. With that rough plan in mind, they all make a run for the temple, barely fending off the three monsters as they go. During this, we get glimpses of both Ruby and John keeping an eye on the people around them. This comes into play when the plan backfires and they end up getting cornered at the temple instead. Weiss begins shouting out orders for people to take, trying to build a better defense. But Ruby, who has a clearer understanding of people's abilities at this point, starts contradicting Weiss and giving countermanding orders, unfortunately causing the pair to backslide into bickering with one another. During their argument, Russell, the only person to listen to Weiss's plan, gets slashed by the Deathstalker, cutting through his aura and leaving a sizable gash on his leg. He falters as another blow comes down, one that his aura is barely able to absorb, before Blake uses her shadow clones and her ribbon whip to pull him out of danger. The crew flee deeper into the ruins, coming across a tower emerging from a deep crevasse. Blake hands Russell off to Cardin, who begrudgingly takes his partner, before she falls in behind Yang. 
The ten students try to cross the bridge to the tower, but the Nevermore destroys it, leaving Ruby, Weiss, Yang, Nora, and John on the tower, and Pyrrha, Ren, Blake, Cardin, and Russell back on solid ground, fending off the Deathstalker and the King Taijitu. Using her hammer, Nora flips her and John back over to their partners to assist, but also accidentally sends Blake hurtling over the edge. Blake manages to recover, even going so far as to get a few extra hits in on the Nevermore as she swings through the air, before reconnecting with Ruby, Weiss, and Yang. Now, the stage is set, with Ruby, Weiss, Blake, and Yang against the Nevermore, John, Pyrrha, Nora, and Ren against the Deathstalker, and Cardin alone against the weakened King Taijitu. Almost comically, he tosses Russell aside like a sack of potatoes, so as to not be weighed down during the fight. When Blake comments on how tough the Nevermore actually is, Yang suggests hitting it with everything they've got. Weiss counters that'll only serve to anger it even more. Ruby, having observed Blake swinging her way back onto the tower, looks between the four and says confidently that she has a plan. Unfortunately, the Nevermore circles back on them before they can implement it, and destroys the upper portion of the tower by flying through it. The four acrobatics up the debris and land on the still-stable section of the tower. Ruby doesn't slow down, yelling for the girls to get into position, and the four split in different directions. Across the bridge, we find Cardin, locked toe-to-tail -toe with the King Taijitsu, but through a demonstration of sheer strength and skill, he brings his mace down on its remaining head, killing it. It vanishes into vapors, leaving only its bony head crest behind. We swap over to John, Pyrrha, Nora, and Ren fighting the Deathstalker, all gradually working into a sink with one another. John and Pyrrha provide the most effective defense with their shields, while Nora and Ren dish out the most damage, going so far as to loosen its stinger, though that last point gets Ren thrown out of the fight. John points out the stinger and yells for Pyrrha to sever it, which she does with her shield, leading to the Deathstalker being impaled on its own stinger. It's still alive, however, so when Pyrrha catches her shield, John instructs Nora to bounce off of it. Nora sails through the air and brings her hammer down on the stinger, a blow powerful enough to finish it. The remaining bridge below them collapses, the Deathstalker sinking in with it, while the three of them are catapulted onto stable land, victorious. They look across the way to the Nevermore fight, where Yang is acting as bait, gaining the Nevermore's attention. At the optimal time, she jumps into its maw and fires a number of rounds down its throat, yelling in time with the blasts, I HOPE YOU'RE HUNGRY! She jumps off, leaving it disoriented enough to crash into the cliffside. From the ruins, Weiss sends out a gigantic wave of ice that pins the bird in place from its tail. We cut over to the tower, where Blake attaches her ribbon to one of the tower's columns and tosses the other end to Yang on a mirroring column, creating a taut slingshot between the two of them. Ruby hops onto it with her scythe, and Weiss draws it back with a glyph. Ruby asks if Weiss can make the shot, prompting the smug response, Hmm, can't I? Ruby, however, misses the sarcasm and asks, Can you? And Weiss cuts her off with, Of course I can! Ruby's face morphs back into her stoic confidence, and Weiss fires her off like a giant scythe-shaped arrow. Ruby wraps her scythe around the Nevermore's neck, pinning it to the wall, and Weiss summons a row of glyphs all the way up the cliffside letting Ruby run up the cliff sideways. Using her speed and firing off every round from her rifle, Ruby rushes up the cliff, dragging the Nevermore the whole way before reaching the top, where the force finally decapitates the bird. Ruby strikes a heroic pose at the top of the cliff as Weiss, Blake, and Yang watch, winded from the fight. The Nevermore and Deathsucker fights were some of the most pivotal in the whole of Volume 1, establishing the high bar of action that Ruby will struggle to hit consistently going forward, especially after Volume 3. I tried my best to stay as faithful as possible here, adjusting only for some of the prior changes I made, and trimming some of the fat from the encounter. The scene cuts to Ozpin and Glinda, watching the events unfold on their scrolls. They converse about how there should not have been any Grimm in the forest, and that the ruins should have been keeping them out. Glinda, though upset, remarks that it was only a matter of time before their ability to repel the Grimm ceased working. Ozpin, however, sees it as a more foreboding omen than just mere chance at play. From there we fade to the Team Coronation Ceremony in Beacon's Auditorium, where Ozpin is just christened Team Cardinal, consisting of Cardin Winchester, Russell Thrush, and two new ancillary characters Dove Bronzewing and Skylark. Cardin has been chosen to lead the team, and he smiles smugly into the crowd. John, Nora, Pyrrha, and Ren are called forth next, forming Team Juniper with John as its leader, prompting Nora to slap his back and Pyrrha to put a proud hand on his shoulder. John, however happy he might be, also looks quite uneasy with the position. Lastly are, of course, Ruby, Weiss, Blake, and Yang, forming the titular Team Ruby, led by Ruby Rose. Weiss stares in horrified disbelief, Blake simply has her eyebrows perked, and Yang has a brief, uneasy look on her face before congratulating her sister and giving her a proud hug. 
we fade away from the celebration to the final scene of the initiation arc. In one of his hideouts, Roman is planning the next stage of his heists, muttering his way through different plans. Few work how he wants them to, commenting that the cops are closing in on his operation too quickly, and he figures they're going to need something to throw the cops off their trail. As he casually thumbs through a news article about the Vital Festival and global financing, he finds an article the next page over talking about the White Fang, showing members of the organization dressed up in matching black, white, and red outfits. Roman's face breaks out into a conniving smile, and we cut to black, ending the episode and this arc.